So, Dr. Clark Larson, thank you so much for joining me. Happy to be here. Fantastic to have you. Could you tell us, uh, could you just kick us off and tell us a little bit about your background and what you do today? Yeah, I'm a, a biological anthropologist. So I study um, human evolution, uh, the record of human evolution from the very beginning, uh, which humans start, hominin start, human ancestors, something like six million years ago. And fortunately, we're continuing to today. But my main area is the last 10,000 years. Um, and I, my, uh, like I say, my field is biological anthropology, my specialty is bioarchaeology, study of human remains, archaeological contexts. And so um, I really got interested in the impact of the transition from hunting and gathering, also known as foraging, to agriculture uh, for my doctoral dissertation uh, back in the late 1970s, which is a long time ago. <laughs> but I've been continuing this this theme of interest ever since. And most recently, um, with regard to the articles and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, this idea uh, came to me because PNS was publishing what are called special features, um, and they wanted to do one on human evolution. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask about that. And so I suggested my topic of recent human evolution, um, and the transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And so they said, yeah, let's let's go with that. And so I developed a proposal to, to invite um, leading authorities, biological anthropologists who deal with different areas of the last 10,000 years. And so I invited experts in population, um, kinship, um, uh, conflict and warfare, uh, disease and health, uh, the genomic record of, of human migration, uh, what happens with ag when agriculture comes in with body size uh, is one indicator of health. Uh, and then uh, the record of, of Holocene climate change and how that's impacted human health. So, I was able to um, pull together a group of top experts uh, in this in these areas. Um, everyone agreed, yeah, that sounds like a really good special feature. So over the last um, more than a year now, um, uh, all my colleagues have been developing their manuscripts and articles, um, which uh, went through the peer review process and uh, heavily reviewed. Uh, all of them looking at different parts of different areas of, of the Holocene and climate change and diet and so forth. Um, so PNAS said, yeah, let's go with that. Uh, this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. So we all developed articles. Uh, and like I say, through the peer review process, uh, experts read all these papers and said, yes, this is this is a good thing to look at. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, uh, we took off and so it's been, mm -hmm. Some time now, the, the development of these these papers and into articles. Well, I mean that that's it's a fascinating area, and there's lots of different areas in there. And yeah. it seems like when we cast our eyes back and we think, many people think about evolution, and we think about people often cast it into these very firm boxes, you know. And we think about humans as just having one long strand of evolution when it's just not that simple. Right. So I, I wonder if you might be able to tell us some of the key tenants around, especially how agriculture has affected us. We can start on a physiological level or a biological yeah. level. Yeah. So early on, when I got interested in this topic, I, I dug into it and instead of some other experts. Uh, but in, but when we look at human evolution, uh, people's eyes kind of glaze over in this sort of recent period. But in fact, it's a highly dynamic period. Um, and it's all uh, centers around that transition from hunting and collecting of wild plants and animals and the nutrition provided by those sources, those resources. And then transition beginning um, probably as early as 11, 12,000 years ago in the Near East where people uh, discover, invent, whatever you want to call it, that they can raise some of these plants and produce uh, more calories than what the wild source produces. Uh, 
And so in the in the old world, wheat, barley, rye, rice in Asia, uh, these plants are domesticated. And um, I think in terms of human evolution, rather quickly, people became dependent on these sources, these resources, food resources. Um, and so uh, some of my colleagues in archaeology think that 10,000 years is quite a long time. But but in terms of my my view, in terms of what I, what I do with biological anthropology and religion, I blink in terms of the human record. Um, so <clears throat> there are a number of things that, that impact health. Uh, the, the food itself. So if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet where it's heavily rice or heavily corn in the new world, uh, uh, these domesticated plants, they don't provide the kind of nutrition that animal sources of protein provide. So it's not it's not a full diet. But on the other hand, in many of these places, pretty historically, they're also hunting and, and so forth and uh, acquiring wild sources of foods. Uh, but when you look at the, the record overall, uh, we can see that the, the dependence on plant cultigens, uh, domesticated plants, becomes more and more important and pretty rapidly. Um, and so these plants lack key essential amino acids uh, with regard to carbohydrates. Uh, uh, the normal bacteria that's in your mouth love those carbohydrates. Um, and so they reproduce. Uh, and the byproduct of those uh, pathogens uh, is, a, is an acid. Uh, so that's what sort of eats away at teeth and creates dental caries uh, or tooth decay. And so one disease, and it is an, it is an infectious disease uh, that arises, is very poor oral health. And so you see in these populations nearly universally, globally, uh, that record of uh, poor oral health. Um, we also see, as I mentioned, is a product of population size increase and sedentary behavior. So hunter-gatherers are, are going from living in small, dispersed, dispersed groups, moving around the landscape, uh, and then settling. Uh, because uh, in order to raise crops and raise domesticated animals, you have to be pretty settled. You're not going to move around the landscape if you've got crops to tend, tend uh, you know, nearby uh, or, or animal stock. So it's not to say that some of these populations are, are don't have a record mobility. Um, one, some of the, some of the places I work with, or some of the populations I work with, there's a there is some mobility, um, but it's nothing like a hunter gatherer in general. That's kind of a simplified version of what hunter gatherers do and farmers do, but by and large they they have those differences. So when you settle a bunch of people in one place year round in close mm -hmm. crowded conditions um they they and there's a pathogen around they're going to spread those pathogens um and so one record that we see um in terms of the foraging to farming transition is an increase in infectious disease in the appearance of new infectious diseases measles smallpox leprosy um uh, and more recently, it's still ongoing with COVID. But, but is, is that just because we can, like, how are we assessing that in comparison to hunter-gatherer times? And like, you we're know, talking like, a let's say a million or two year, million years ago. How are we deciphering? Are we able to see that in the bone record? Yeah, we do see it in the bone record. Um, leprosy has a distinctive uh, pathological expression in the face and um, and uh, we see with regard to dental caries, um, that's a different kind of pathogen, but we see poor oral health and um, <clears throat> and tooth loss and so forth. And you need your teeth to eat. And so we see in some of these populations, particularly elderly people, uh, losing all their teeth by the time they're, they're 30 or 40. Um, and so these are pre-industrial populations that don't have the kind of uh, technology we have to make up for those lost teeth with regard to dentures and so forth. Um, 
but but one and one thing is, is we we see in many of these populations. Um, uh, for example, I work at a site in Turkey called Chantal Hoyuk, um, and there it's a it's a it started out as a small group of families, several families, and within a, a couple thousand years, um, uh, increases to a population of five to eight thousand people at its peak. And so you got all those people living very closely together, um, and you see the record of of um, of helmets uh, and so forth in in the population that's uh, parasites. Uh, the the <clears throat> the uh, the animals that they're they've domesticated, uh, for example, cattle, uh, goats, and so forth, they're living right in the community in this densely crowded community. Uh, so. Uh, that that is key here in terms of health, is the spread of infection uh, infectious disease, and also the fact that the living circumstances are relatively poor. They're you know in many of these communities are living uh, right on their waste. Uh, we see records of bone infections, non-specific infections where someone gets a cut on the finger or the leg, and that they 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 don't have medicine. And, and so forth, so that that infection spreads to the bone. So we see a record of that also in many agricultural societies, uh, the the kinds that I look at, the archaeological record. Uh, so that too is is important. Uh, I mean, w w one thing that strikes me there is that many people that will listen to this show will be people who understand that that an animal based diet is better for human health and can be sort of illustrated and a lower carbohydrate diet can be better for human health. But what strikes me there is that although that we can put that on one side for, for human nutrition, we also have this other side where it's like agriculture and farming allowed a population explosion. So, Absolutely. so yeah. there's obviously we got, we got reduction in health on one side, but perhaps an increase in either fertility on the other side, or, or I mean, right. how do you, how do you rationalize that? Well, it, so yeah, so the, there there is this is um, it also is sort is how evolution works. It's all about the adult surviving to reproductive age, and uh, that's how the genetic record is continued. So it's kind of a trade off in human biology. Um, now today, of course, in our own society, we we don't have we have lots of health challenges, but not the kinds of challenges that we see in these early farming or farming settings in, in archaeological contexts, where there is no uh, medicines or care of health uh, in many ways. So there you see that, and like I said, it's all about surviving to reproduce. That's the record of evolution. So it doesn't really matter if your health quality is less than what we're all used to. You, you see what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. It's a, it's a it's kind of a trade off, but so, so the overall is that one can still be unhealthy but still fertile. Exactly right. Um, so if you look at you know medieval societies in these densely crowded cities, that's that's where you know uh, some of the infectious diseases really take off: uh, leprosy and measles and influenza and, and so forth. So uh, it's all about the quality of the diet. But also the kind of community living circumstances uh, that that changes. So that's kind of a simple way of looking at all this because there's a, there's a lot of variability. And in this PNS special feature, we we look at these population trends um, in terms of uh, population increase. Um, we look at the record of mobility and and uh, for example, at Chattahoyak, we see a record of people moving in from elsewhere um, into the community. And so that was investigated by one of the one of the authors, one of the author groups. Um, another record we see is uh, the origins of of, um, of organized warfare. That's a that I think is a huge deal in terms of of uh, it's there's there's always been interpersonal conflict. You can see the record of someone getting bashed over the head in, in Neanderthals. Uh, so that's not new. But what we see, one record, we see one of the authors, Fibiger's group, looked at uh, the record of warfare 
in Europe, um, in early farmers in Northwestern Europe. So how do, how do you differentiate that sort of style of warfare versus what we would consider as sort of maybe just low scale tribal warfare? Yeah, well, you know, I would say that her article really points out how just a record of deaths that occur in these conflicts in um, in early farmers in Northwestern Europe. Um, and they're, um, they're, they're seeing, this is, uh, this is Neolithic Europe, early farmers. Mm-hmm. And they, they refer to the warfare as endemic, meaning that it's all around. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the model is that as population increases, these are early farmers. Yeah. You, you think, that, and just to go a step further, that's like, it's resource protection. It's people right. getting more protective over their land, their area, their crops right, that right. they're growing. They've built more permanent structures like houses and and yeah. the, all these sorts of things. Yeah, all that. And plus, you know, um, we've got a community that may be nearby saying, you know, what they have over there is better than we got. And we're we're struggling. So, you know what? We're, we're going after it. And now that's kind of a simple way of looking at it. But but it's all it's all about a resource demands and what a group is willing to do to get the resources for the support of that community or population uh I, that's what what i think we've learned from this of course most of us have been looking at early warfare and these other conditions for some years but uh i think northwestern europe really shows what's taking place and there's an incredible record of of warfare related violence and injury uh in in that region and you and that is that that we have a direct correlation basically of increase of agriculture and an increase of of warfare and indications of warfare population and then in competition exactly okay. so it, it's it's a uh, it's a package now i'm sure that uh, that there are authorities out there who may be listening or watching and go, oh, that's a bunch of crap. But you <laughs> Don't know listen to them. <laughs> I, 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 we, our group um, has had many discussions about this. And, you know, they're not, they're not engaging in life-threatening conditions for themselves for the fun of it. Uh, let's go in there and, and if some come out, well, too bad. Um you know what I mean? I what, mean why, why might people argue against that hypothesis? Um, that the hypothesis that that uh, that uh, warfare um, is something to do and not to worry worry about it. Uh, yeah. Um, so that I, it's just I, innate, regardless of resources. Yeah, here's a, yeah. I I I don't think it's innate. I think that humans, well. Humans are they're they're cultural animals. Um, let me take out animals. They're they're culturally <laughs> bound. Um, they learn behaviors. Um, they're taught behaviors. And if the parents and the elderly in the community are saying, you know, it's time to move. Um, we we need to do. We're not doing very well. And here's what you need to do uh, to their. 12 year old or 13 year old uh, male probably uh, uh, they say we're going to train you to do this because we we need it um, and so uh, that's a that's a kind of a simple way of looking at it uh, but why these communities are are interacting in these ways um, I don't think there's a, any other um, a, any other explanation for why they're doing it mm-hmm. and and in terms of how we see the actual morphology or the the size of humans change or the facial features of humans change how has that changed since the introduction yeah. of agriculture i well i would say that that there 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 have been some changes we don't talk about these in this series but series of articles but there's now a long there's a, a large um uh, uh literature on what happens to the human face when when uh, humans go from eating wild plants and animals, uncooked or poorly, uh, pro- poorly processed, to when they start cooking those foods, and so it's also the Neolithic where when pottery is invented, and generally speaking, when they start to cook food, 
into soft textures. And what we see in the record, and I, I kind of wish we had an article on this in this series, but we had to cut it off somewhere. <laughs> um, but there's a, a really great literature I've written about some of it myself, where the, the facial bones are decreasing in size, reflecting the fact that the masticatory muscles, the chewy muscles are attached side to the head, the jaws and so forth, are reducing in size in response to that reduced consistency of food. So cooking into soft mushes occurs with the origins of ceramics, which is about 10, 11, 12,000 years ago. And at the outside, I'm not an expert exactly on when ceramics are invented, but but cooking of food is, is critically important uh, in use of those ceramics. So we see globally, wherever populations make that transition of farming and cooking their food, which is all agriculturalists, we begin to see these cranial facial changes mm. uh, in the in the skulls. So I kind of wish we had an article on that here, but it's, yeah. it's been such a worked over field that I, I got kind of tired of it myself. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to bore you with it a little bit more today. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, no, so also, uh, th there's some things in, in that we also see emerging today and, and other either confounding variables or other aspects that we say may be changing the morphology of, of the facial feature. One particularly being that we're sitting down a lot with, with the with the head and chin forward or the head yeah. forward, certainly, which is pulling the, the jawline in, as well as things like mouth breathing a lot, rather mm -hmm. than breathing through the nose and the nasal passage and, right. and, and breathing that is potentially exaggerated from intense physical exertion perhaps running and you know in the hunting yeah. aspect as well as um our decreased feeding window in terms of how long we take on each meal we're eating while yeah. we're doing stuffing stuff in a distracted fashion so we're not chewing as much anyway regardless of whether it's meat or yeah. grains or, or a cooked food yeah so i i had this discussion with my uh dennis uh on a pretty regular basis um and orthodontist uh and um they're all they're all now they're uh, well i won't say all but uh at least in the school of where my dentist got his training in the dental school um for them it's all about uh and he talks to me about it when i when i have my you know teeth checked and that it's got to be related to sleep and breathing and I, I I I see no evidence for that in terms of why bone would change, mm. and it's all about bones change to become more more robust or less robust depending on the, the the mechanical demand on that bone itself. So bone, it is a here. This is a fact. Responds to mechanical demand, um, and it gr it grows more. It grows bigger. You have that. You have that capacity to have that happen. Now, you know what, you can't do that as, a, as an elderly adult, mm -hmm. but as a child or adolescent, early adult. Um, and there's a, a ton of experimental evidence on laboratory animals showing what happens when they eat soft textured foods versus uh, hard textured foods. So there's an area of science where, in my view, is pretty solid. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we didn't look at that. I'd like to. In the We didn't look at that in this series of papers, but... But I do talk about it in, in some of my other publications. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's it's uh, it's a, that, that too is a, is a development. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to prepare these articles for this PNS series, uh, I just couldn't find an expert or someone willing to to work on that part of it. Um, oh, ne next time, next one. <laughs> yeah, the next one. So you know another another part that we have really talked about yet is is the record of inequality. Um, and so in, in farming, uh, so that is a huge topic now in the world, um, talking about who has access to quality nutrition, who doesn't. And um, in terms of, of this health disparities and, and inequality. And um, so the lead article in the PNAS series by Gwen Robin Shug and her co-authors uh, looked at the record of, of climate change uh, and human health and origins of and record of inequality. Um, who's getting the resources and who isn't? And how does that play out in prehistory? 
complex topic, but there's a there's a lot of work that's been been done on that. So so and that 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 article, it's a lead article in the in the special feature, um, gets at the at the issues relating to inequality with the rise of farming and who has resources and who doesn't, or who has more resources and who has less. Uh, so that I think is a is something that <laughs> it's not innate in humans by any any means, mm -hmm. but it's something that we see still today globally, um, and it's it's a uh, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. I, I had I had heard a a a take on that that for instance in cultures such as ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. the in the introduction and proliferation of farming enabled those who were either the the sort of the kings or the pharaohs to accumulate wealth through taxation uh -huh. and therefore that taxation allowed them to perpetuate their wealth from season to season across seasons and, and to to elevate that wealth over time and roll it over through hundreds of years time to generation after generation accumulation of wealth whereas uh -huh. previous hunter gatherers communities just wouldn't have had the storage facilities wouldn't have had uh -huh. the ability to retain wealth in such a way yeah, and they and they don't have those storage facilities because they're they're on the move, um, and there's a really wonderful archaeological literature on hunter gatherers, um, and um, uh, it, it's it's really a rich rich record, and I think we've got that one figured out um, about resources and uh, hunter gatherers and and the the, the non accumulation of wealth. There are exceptions. Um, but I would say, by and large, globally, that's that's pretty clear. And and it's it's funny that you should mention that um, you know we've got these inequalities throughout the world now, where cultures, perhaps more prolific in in Africa and South America, and some of these traditionally um, less um, economically developed countries, have um, have a real want, and there's there's a desire to have more meat in the diet and more animal-based products in the diet. Whereas in the West, in the developed sides, oh. uh, there's been this huge rise of the cult of veganism and yeah. vegetarianism, and we're pushing away meat. Whereas the old epoch, it's saying, you know, we need meat to be healthy. That's what our taste buds crave. Yeah, yeah, it, a absolutely. And, and to be healthy, um, you, you gotta have, you have to have adequate protein. Um, and so, and, and like you say, in, in sort of industrialized societies and say in the U.S. or uh, where the, there's a kind of a, a move among some for re reduction of meat. Um, and um, I, I think that 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 is is going in the wrong direction because it's about it's about a nutrition. What the, what is a nutritious diet? And if you're if you're you can make up some of that without meat. Um, successfully but but that that is a lot of work um i i i don't know that work myself but uh, the 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 clear best record of best source of a full diet uh, with all the amino acids you need the full protein is is animal sources i would totally agree i would totally yeah. agree at least i mean i was reading back on one of your old papers from i think it was 1999 or 1990s and you, you specifically make the link between the bioavailability of uh -huh. nutrients in plants. It just isn't, even if it's in there, for instance, niacin or one of the vitamin B, B nutrients, oh, it's, right. it's just not available for us to digest. It's chemically bound in particularly in maize. So yeah. diets oh. rich in these plants and these, these heavily this heavy agricultural crops just don't have access to these nutrients yeah yeah exactly right um and so that's that's <clears throat> that is the big problem with with uh, many of these early farming at least what they're represented archaeologically um is the the unavailability of key essential amino acids and in a full protein mm. and and in terms of let's going back going back to some of your the the research that you've done certainly on on bones well i mean ha, what is the actual how are you measuring this I, i've heard some stuff called the stable isotope yeah, yeah. and so, so can you tell us a little bit about how you're actually devolving sure. the you know bone bone density and actual diseases that, yeah. that these early humans had 
Yeah, so the, the stable isotope area is a really important area for reconstructing that. So archaeologically, we see, let's, let's take Chattahoyak again, but I, I worked at a whole number of places. I'm just sort of using Chattahoyak as kind of a model. Um, we can see they're, they're eating plants that the, the plants are preserving and so forth. Um, but the, the, the record in terms of the diet is, is the fact that those plants commonly, uh, depending on the plant, they're missing essential amino acids. Um, so that's what, that's what is, a, it's not a full, it's not a full protein. Um, so in those populations that are consuming the, that don't have access to those amino acids or reduced access, um, that's, that's where the problem comes in. Whereas animal sources of protein have the full record of the full sweep of the amino acids in a full protein. Is that is that where you were? Yeah, ex exactly. So, so in terms of looking at the actual bone and bone density, when people yeah. talk about bone density, they're looking at the amino acid profile. Yeah, there, that's part of what they're looking at. But the the bone density, um, uh, what we're actually looking at when we talk about density of bone is particularly what we see in X rays of bone. So, as you're maturing and growing into adulthood your bone is forming and, and becoming denser and and so forth. But what happens if, after about age 40 is that uh, the bone becomes more and more porous because uh, it's kind of hard to explain without images, but, but the bone has a blood supply itself and it's constantly turning over. That is, there are these cells that are eating away at the bone and then, then cells that replace the bone be, behind them microscopically. Um, and so over time, uh, you are losing more and more bone. After about age 40, you begin the other, begins to go downhill in terms of amount of bone you have in your skeleton. Even even with physical activity and perfect nutrition? Absolutely. It's, it's universal. So those who, I, it's a really important to exercise and to maintain your bone quality while you're growing and developing into adulthood. But after 40, there is, there's no turning back. You're going to lose bone. But is that, I just want to jump in there because I've heard people postulate and theorize that that trend that we see in the research of sort of a universal reduction in bone density after the age of 40 is yeah. only done on populations who are, who are having the same, you know, might have a reduction of physical activity naturally after the age of 40 because of the societies we live in. They might have a reduction in... Um, or, or or that low level hum of grains that we're having, the plant anti nutrients, everything in between. So, have these studies been done on people who are having, who are firstly strength training all the way through and past forty, up to 60, 70, 80, 90, and who are having a let's say a Paleolithic diet? Yeah, yeah. The issue is when that behavior is occurring. So, if you're if you are having what the expected physical level physical activity which sadly is not most of us <laughs> because really your 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 skeleton is is adapted to strenuous physical activity and and uh, so it's good but your bone is going to grow regardless but here's the thing after age 40 it doesn't it, if you've got more bone if you've been physically active and so forth you're probably better off but in terms of the big picture, if you're living to 80, you've lost a lot of bone. It, and you may have a somewhat more bone than, uh, than someone, someone else who hasn't been physically active. Uh, but there is a gigantic literature on that whole topic. And it's just 40, and you're going to start losing bone. Oh, no. I've got 10 um, years. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and, uh, but... On the other hand, if you've been physically active your whole life, your 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 bone quality is probably going to be better. And uh, and and that was the next question: is is it if one keeps training and has, let's say, in inverted commas, perfect nutrition, yeah. is there is there a linear increase in bone density up until forty, and then it starts to come down, or is it peak at twenty and maintain at twenty or so? Yeah, it it pretty much peaks twenty, you know, so forth, depending on the level of physical activity. Okay, but um, yeah, that's that's one thing that that I get across students I'm lecturing about uh, last time. In fact, 
in class about, um, let me tell all of you, your bones are, are still growing. Um, and you know what a lot of people don't realize is, is that when you do a cross section of a bone, you see where the nerve supply is, complex, the blood supply, very complex. Uh, and what you do see though, is the appearance of these, these uh, hollow circles where the, there is a blood supply, an increase in frequency of what are called osteons or round little features that have a blood supply. Um, and that's what eventually weakens the bone by the, just a continuous development. Hence the term osteoporosis. Right. And so some uh, el elderly people who are in the 80s, um, here's, here's my best advice. Don't fall. Um, <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the areas of the skeleton uh, that's very sensitive is uh, on the, the top of the femur, where the, the femur articulates with the pelvis. It's the, the femoral neck. Uh, that's what's usually breaking. So when someone says balls and breaks her leg, it's, it's that, that area, or breaks her hip, that's usually what's referred to. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that area of the hip, but it's actually part of the, the thigh bone, the femur. And, and it, it's interesting you bring in age now, because that was a topic that I wanted to, to touch on, because often the introduction of agriculture is hailed as, you know, a great leap forward in, in health for humans and our ability to live longer, healthier lives and, and you know, the, the abundance of nutrition or the abundance of certainly calories. And but that may not be the picture I've heard from other scientists suggesting that I don't know whether it's telomere length suggests that we have a much older age sort of programmed into us but it's our diet that is reducing our age yeah it's a it's a diet and the level of activity your sort of normal daily activity uh i'd say most um uh, come around after dinner time that's when we you know settle into whatever watch on tv or so mm -hmm. forth but um that i think in terms of the record of human evolution um is is different um i doubt that our neanderthal ancestors or pre-farmers are, are settling into you know what would they watch you know so <laughs> yeah. so so um it's yeah so the the these 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 trends in uh hunting gathering the farming are are complex or many of them mm -hmm. but the big picture um and for our own population, sort of Western and where diets are, are that universally uh, uh, consistent, um, there, there, there are advantages we've had in terms of li living to older age. Mm -hmm. But um, at what at what price? What quality? When if you're 80 and you and you're you're um, not able to get out of bed or walking, uh, is that is that quality of life but that's a whole other discussion yeah but but that well that was slightly what i was alluding to here was that is there a way to have a look from the bone records that we can see once the hunter gatherers are generally phasing out to, in order to move yeah. towards more settled you know and, and agrarian based uh populations can we see like the age reduce or age increase or, or anything around what you can tell us about the actual you know, life expectancy yeah i would say that and i would say that um for most industrialized countries um that 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 life expectancy is increasing um uh, but but again uh, what is the quality of of life in those later 70s and 80s and 90s um and we, we see people who do very well but in general um uh, well, probably going to lifestyle earlier in their life where highly sedentary, perhaps uh, too many calories. Um, that's that that creates uh, conditions where where uh, life is an, uh, an older age it may may not be so uh, so comfortable or or adequate. Mm -hmm. it, it, but it seems to be even just you know, that layer further of just overconsumption of calories, it seems to be like there's a particular issue with over overconsumption of calories from grains and from farmed uh, yep. crops. Yep, that's, that's exactly right. That's, that's, that's the record, particularly not for our own society, but for much of prehistory.
is a, that, that crop record. Now, um, in a number of these places, like Chetelhurik, um, they're also raising farm animals. Um, and one one thing that, that we documented with, with regard to that particular city is that, and this is true for, I think, today in many places uh, where the resources around the community are being depleted. Uh, so arable land is being depleted. Um, the animals that are that are grazing near the community early on now need to go further away. And so the animals aren't doing that by themselves. They're being herded by the, the, the people who are responsible for herding these animals. So one thing we, we looked at with regard to Channel Hoyk, and this really should be looked at in other places as well, um, is we looked at the record of the biomechanical impact on the skeleton. And so what happens for people who are who are doing a lot of walking and running, in particular long distance walking and running, the the shape of their of their femur, um, the thigh bone changes, the cross sectional shape uh, from oh, wow. from going very sedentary to being very active, and so that reflects the fact that bone responds to mechanical demands. Um, it places bone where it's needed. It takes away where it's not. And so we looked at that record in children uh, at Chettlehook and found that uh, early on children have sort of more roundish shaped cross sections of femurs. And then later in the community, several thousand years later, it's more oblong front to back. And that reflects the fact that the bone is, is that bone responds to mechanical demands. Mm -hmm. So when you're walking or running, the, the femur wants to bend from the hip backward and the knee backward. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of forces right in the mid part of the of the bone. So it's a highly dynamic tissue that does respond. Wow. So we looked at that as well. That That's fascinating. And that's another area I wanted to touch on is this. So you're saying that, that that's a, um, I guess we're talking about almost epigenetics there. That That's like something in the environment that stimulated that change directly. So, oh, right. so the genes right. have the ability to change, but they need the stimulus from the environment. So in many ways, we can see that that's sort of, that's very short term, quick human evolution to match that environment. So yeah. I've also heard around um, things like lactase and amylase and these other enzymes that are becoming more present in some populations to account for the changes in diet. So is that something that you've seen as well? Yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, the record of, yeah, I haven't looked at it personally, but uh, I, there's a, is a growing literature on that, on that topic. Um, and one of the articles, uh, let's see if I can dig it up here. I just happen to have on my, my desk uh, well prepared <laughs> yeah yeah um, and it's really a very important article by by jay stock um and his colleagues looking at trends of human body size and uh they're they're they're, they're looking at ne neolithic farmers who um uh, are acquiring other food source for access to protein and that's milk and milk products so that's taking place and also elsewhere as well. Uh, and so there's a selection, um, uh, they call it the, uh, it's a selective sweep for lactase persistence. Uh, so that, 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 uh, that's being documented now in these, in these early, early farmers, um, uh, so, so, so they, products. So they're having an, uh, you, they're having an increase in bone size from having more, um, milk in the diet uh, or dairy? Yeah, well, they, uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, they, they, yeah, they, they're looking at bone size and found that it was, stature and body mass is stable, but it increases in uh, Central and Northern Europe. And this is work that Jay Stock and his group did for the special feature. And really uh, just an amazing article because they, they look at that uh, at that record of, of when milk products come in, which is fairly late in human evolution in Europe and Africa and elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's another source of protein um, in terms of, in terms of diet. And calcium presumably for, for exactly. bone strength and, and everything that we see there. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, 
that's another record of this whole farming transition that yeah. uh, that they were investigating. Yeah, I mean, because it's it's very interesting because on on it's very much a double edged sword. This whole introduction of agriculture in human history, like on one side, it's let us create these vast cities and societies that freed up a lot of manpower and energy that would have been taken from you know going out to forage and hunter gather and allowed us to concentrate on sciences arts you know everything in between so i have a big truck driving past mexico is oh. not famed for it <laughs> for, for its quiet vehicles yeah um so, so so there's been this incredible flourishing that agriculture has allowed on some level on, on a, yeah. i guess on a huge level but yeah. on the other side of the corn uh, the uh, sorry that's a freudian slip on the other side of the uh the coin there's been this proliferation of disease and, you know, type two diabetes and these high carbohydrate diets and, you know, tooth decay and, you know, the mouth being a barometer for overall health, really. So yeah. I wonder if I could get your opinion on it. Is, is it a, is it a, what's the balance of ba positives and negatives here? Yeah. You know, that that's really hard to say because it's all about the, the culture of the setting or the region or globe. And in culture, if it's if it's okay to do it, but there's a price to pay, it, it may not it may not matter. Um, culturally, that, that's kind of that's the kind of the, the 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 base for humans that other animals don't have. I mean, some of the primates have, you know, sort of simple cultures, tool, technology, and so forth. But um, at the base of it all is that that's what our behavior has, has taught us. Our parents have taught us. And their their parents taught them and their parents and so forth, all the way back into prehistory. Um, so I think that I think that, that that's part of it as well, is what what is learned behavior may not be necessarily the best behavior. Um, kind of a simplistic way of looking at it, but um, it's it's a it's a clear record of how humans behave yeah yeah it's it's interesting isn't it i mean because we see so much of i don't know whether i can get your view on on veganism and vegetarianism now that's coming in because i i've heard that the lifespan of not the lifespan sorry that that's the yeah. wrong word to use the 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 dietary span of a vegan taking on a vegan diet is around eight six to eight years is how long they can go and, and before all these real sort of health issues start showing up oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. For, from a lack of, I'll have to check up on that. I'll have to check yeah, up. I'll, on that. I'll use that in my next lecture. Yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. 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 You can reference me there. I'll yeah. get the citation ready. Cause I've always <laughs> wondered what, you know, I've never really looked into it. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, I could easily, you know, get into the, you know, do a Google search for, you know, this and that, but yeah. or go to the library and check it out. But yeah. I've often thought that, you know, how do they do this? Mm. Um, without really important essential amino acids and in a broad diet well i i think that's the whole the the whole thing is that many times when people change diets is that they they have an, a benefit because they're generally deficient in something you know yeah. so that change promotes oh hey i feel great you know there's the sort of placebo effect as well they feel good that and then after six months or a year that's when the deficiencies start really taking hold and uh, speaking to Dr. Bill Schindler on the same podcast, and, and he was saying, you know, veganism really isn't actually possible without a huge amount of technical innovation and technological interventions, you know, shipping stuff from all around the world and, and sprouting oh. seeds and soaking seeds and, you know, cooking and all of this stuff, which the 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 general lay man or woman isn't prepared to do nor do they have time to do nor do they have the the impetus to go and seek out that knowledge so many people doing the vegan diet now are you know really struggling and um but it's it's almost like a religion you know that's really interesting because i i also have a, i'm an author of a uh of a introductory biological anthropology textbook and i'm i'm going to add that to my do, do. Uh, do. Yeah, in fact, yeah. I don't know if you can see it, but it's at our origins. Oh um, yeah, I see that there. I yeah, see that uh, there. Yeah. And it it's it, there it allows me to really get into the record of the full evolutionary picture. But the veganism thing is um I I 
wonder when that started, uh, how it started, and um, wh what are people thinking when they, you know, yeah. knowing that they're not getting a full, full, uh, full diet, full nutrition? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating side. I, I believe that some of its roots were certainly in the the '60s and '70s with with sort of flower power and you know, you know, sustainable, love the earth, hug the trees, and everything in that, and not not wanting to harm animals and certainly there was an increase there but th th there's a lot of research coming out now which is the association between certainly mental health issues um bone density issues um yeah you know, like many many issues that are seen more often more regularly in diets that are devoid of animal products huh. and there is even um a lot of people will sp i don't know if you've heard of loma linda which it, yeah. yeah so that's the that's the seventh day adventist sort of communes and so that church that they're the, the seventh day adventist church are big believers in the in in a meat-free diet and you know no meat no no and heavily be grains based oh. on the basis that that would you know squash um they call the vasa passions you know sort of the want to fornicate or masturbate oh, or do any of these sexual yeah. passions uh -huh. and then that would lead us closer to you know the, having the kingdom of heaven on earth oh, sure. and so and they actually have a lot of infiltration into some of the nutritional um, guidelines that we see today they, they own many sort of healthcare systems in in the u.s so it's fascinating on, on that side of things where we see the sort of the these big sort of religious tenants influencing this ah. plant-based agenda so that that sort of and obviously there's lots of other things going on there but i sure. know that there's these big um there are many sort of vested interests but certainly they leverage the fact that they call a vegan diet and if anyone who eats meat less than two times a month oh. so technically it's oh. not vegan but they leverage that small uh, that small amount of animal products to leverage health so a lot of people will reference that and say the vegan diet is, you know, it's a very strong diet. You just have a look at Loma Linda and you just have a look at these blue zones. And actually there is a small amount of animal products in the diet. And um, so it's fascinating. The research out there is very, it's very skewed in a lot of areas, but if you know where to look, maybe that's yeah, my own biases. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, uh, one area we, we didn't really talk about is the, is human dispersals with the uh, shift from foraging and farming. And there's a really great article here uh, by Mark Stone King and his his group, um, and they they're at the Max Planck Institute, one of them in in Germany, and they have they have pioneered the record of the ancient genomes, uh, the genomic record to look at uh, population movements, dispersals, and so he's got a great article in this in this uh, special feature. Mm -hmm on global dispersions, mainly with the purpose of looking at how these plants, uh, the idea of farming is transported. And uh, so the genomic record now, what, what, it's just so incredible because uh, you can tie down where the person's from, uh, family, you know, their movement, uh, and their archeological record. So, so this is people taking seeds i suppose from one area and then bringing them to another and you can see that generations down the line that you can see that they've been feeding on the same plant genome or how is that how are they deciphering uh, I would say, that? well that we're looking at the human genome okay so that you can see that the movement yeah across from different areas yeah and you can see the record of of uh intermarriage and and uh gen and gene flow and mm -hmm. the whole record so his article's got got a bunch of maps in it that shows globally yeah. Where, where people are wow. moving and um, that seemed to yeah. take off more since the introduction of agriculture yeah that yeah as and in part it may be related sort of to the issue of that we discussed with regard to europe and why do people move and they they do because um i i would say this is an oversimplification but they do because they have to if we're not going to move we're we're not going to be doing very well. And mm -hmm. uh, so 
they're they're moving. We don't really know the reasons why populations picking up and moving their plants and you know and everything else they do. But um, but that's that's kind of one of the that is an important part of this whole kind of research stream going forward is is figuring that out. Why why are they doing it? Can, can you postulate on that? I mean, is that people who are the settlement, some part, part, portion, you know, 80% of the settlement stay and then 20% sort of break off? Or is this sort of whole settlement go, you know, we need to leave? Yeah, it ranges from, you know, a few people to the, like, the whole group, mm. um, which is another area they're looking at that your very question is, is what does that represent? Is it everybody? Is it is it one part of it? Uh, and so early on, though, these populations, communities tend to be pretty isolated. Uh, so it's only with, you know, later in the Neolithic and, you know, more modern periods where we have continuous population. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. I mean, we're coming up to time now. So I'm okay. just curious, I'm just curious, knowing what you know now about agriculture and all these grains coming in, what, what what's your diet? How do you oh, eat? Um, you look like a very healthy chap. Yeah. I, I, uh, well, that's because I have my my spouse is a wonderful cook. Um, oh, that that helps. She, yeah. <laughs> so she, uh, yeah. So we're we're we are we have a high a nutritious and and full diet at home. Um, but before I got married, I'm not so sure I would I would say that. Uh, <laughs> but, but what do you devolve uh, as a nutritious and full diet? Anything you avoid uh, and anything you specifically include? Well, there 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 are a number of things that she tells me I need to avoid. Um, <laughs> What what you're gonna have another beer? Um, <laughs> um, yeah. but, what about all those grains in the beer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we yeah we eat our sugar grains and so forth. But, but um, I think between the two of us, we have a, a really good sense of what what is good nutrition, and mm. we both read about. It. I do because of you know my work, um, and she does because she she just always has. Um, mm. But I I think that I think that. Um, Public education about nutrition is really, really important. Um, when I talk to my students in my classes, in fact, I go, I go teach at about four o'clock. Um, uh, my osteology class, um, they, they're. It's remarkable how uh, it's not a good word, clueless, but how much how, how they lack an understanding of nutrition. Mm. Uh, and so I think that 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 is important in terms of public education. It should be, I think it should be a required, not my osteology course, but a nutrition course. Uh, I, I, I would agree, but I think it's so polluted. The whole yeah. nutrition scene is so polluted for, for some of the reasons that I was mentioning earlier, you know, sort yeah. of tie-ins with big business and that there was a chart that came up the other day that was looking at the the nutritional qualities of different foods. And I think it's called the compass study. It's well worth looking up. And at the top of it for nutritional value is watermelon. And just below that is... What's that study? It's called the Compass Study, C-O-M-P-A-S-S, I believe. Okay. So, and that's looking at the nutritional values of of different food items. And the, the whole problem here is that governments and research bodies are scoring them on dogmatic pretenses so for instance the overall dogma that saturated fat is bad so therefore a food item in saturated fat is then drawn down to the lower end of the scale so things like beef and butter yeah. and ghee and good animal-based fats get draw drawn down to the bottom of the scale wow. where whereas it's very easy to game the system so things like fortified cereal products like frosted mini wheats or <laughs> shreddies or weetabix that these big companies can put lots of you know folate and niacin and vitamin a and vitamin k and vit so on a scale it can show oh wow look at how many vitamins and minerals yeah. are in these products this is clearly a very high nutritious and nutritious food on this scale so it puts it to the yeah. bottom of this uh, at the top of the scale so then you get these sort of skewed nutritional pyramids which tell people hey we've got to increase our watermelon or, and and cereal consumption and reduce our consumption of animal products um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a terribly polluted zone whereby, you know, top of mind, you think I'm going to divert to the authority, you know, government or these government health bodies to tell me what to eat. And you look there and it's completely the opposite of what one should be eating, you know, so oh, it's, yeah. it's no wonder that people switch off or they engage with it and get incredibly unhealthy and then lose hope. Yeah. 
Yeah, now I, I yeah, it's really, really complicated. Um, I, I have the same impression. Um, but I, what, I, what I go with is what I have learned from my professionally um, and in my research, looking at populations where they're not getting enough of protein. Um, and and you can see those. And so I, my recommendation is kind of nutrition science is pay attention to what anthropologists are doing. And they're not all dealing with dead people like I am. <laughs> they're they're working with living populations and doing field work and me, taking important measurements about what their diets are. And we can the the great thing is in in biological anthropology and nutrition science probably, but biological anthropologists tend to look at the global view. Nutrition scientists tend to be more what the American public is like, where they're looking at well, what do we do in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. and middle class U.S. So uh, anthropology offers that broad perspective of what can go wrong and why it's going wrong and what humans are doing. That's that's one kind of great thing about about our field is that that global that Absolutely. global record. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, learning from our past to inform our future yeah, and how we oh. how we implement things. I mean it's yeah. it's yeah, um, we... I was just gonna say that at Channel Hook, for example, uh, we had a PNS article on Channel Hoyk in 2019, I think it is. It was, um, I was elected to the National Academy. And so they had you do an article and they said, well, I'll do one on Channel Hoyk. And it just, it's like a microcosm of don't do this. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it may seem great. It may seem great in the beginning where we're growing and we got all these, you know, it's just incredibly, it looks like Kansas. Uh, in terms of the landscape and, mm. and agricultural content. And, uh, hey, this is great. We got this. We got this little group of us, and we're going to be fine. Uh, but then that thing that happens, but we, we didn't really, we talked a little bit about warfare in Europe. Mm. Um, at Channel Hoyek, um, once that population begins to grow, and they're living in these really close, crowded houses, uh, we begin to see a rise in the appearance of what are called depressed fractures, which are these indentations in someone's forehead where someone else has taken a hammer. Oh, wow. So they've been know, bashed. Dang, yeah. So uh, that's another <laughs> downside of, of agriculture, these large close crowded communities. Wow. Wow. That, that's yeah. a, uh, that's another topic for another day, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, Dr. Clark Larson, if, if anyone wants to find more about your research, where can they find that? What would they search for? Yeah, just uh, do a search for my name. And um, that's probably the best way, you know, um, uh, there's also a lot of people aren't familiar with the academics are, but there's a, a, a web page called Google Scholar. And uh, you've probably seen it, but it yeah. lists the person's all their publications and their citations. And not only not only that, but the trends of, their, of the, how they're being cited. <laughs> some people don't like it because it's kind of going down. Yeah, uh, competition but, uh, between scientists yeah. out there. <laughs> so that's a really good, good source too, just Google, Google Scholar. Fantastic, fantastic. Dr. Clark Larson, thank you so much for coming to speak today. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome, and and been really good to talk to you. And uh, if you have any questions, follow up, uh, just email me and we can, we can clear it up. 100%. Thanks a lot. Okay, take care. Bye.